episode 5 is called First Shots of Winter Lads. It's deep into the winter, the sun is gone. Some men, led by Lieutenant DeVoe, are taking scientific observations. Not magnetism, as was common in polar expeditions, but the temperature. It's minus 47 degrees centigrade, minus 52 Fahrenheit. Much of Terror's crew has moved to Erebus because of the ice buildup underneath, and because of the flogging, and because Crozier wouldn't let them harm Lady Silence. Good Sir is continuing his attempt to learn a language, and is slowly succeeding. Very slowly, as she can't speak English either. He's decided that he'd like to write in English to a Nictitut dictionary when they get home. He's going about this the hard way, though, because in real life, and in the show, Crozier already spoke the language. And in the show, Blanky did too. I know I've mentioned this before, but the subplot keeps happening. But still, he keeps muddling along with silence, someone who speaks less English than he speaks in Nictitut. And the book spoke even less in general, because he had no tongue. Fitzjames has ordered silence to be moved back to the Terror. His men have been doubling up for over a month now, and they believe that she's in control of the tomb back. So he wants to be rid of her to minimise the very real chance of trouble. We see Dr. Stanley casually cutting a poor frostbitten man's toes off. Dr. Stanley in the show is stoic and unpleasant. But out of the options available to him, that is by far the kindest thing he can do for him. Apart from the obvious damage caused by frostbite, it was painful. In the Scots South Pole expedition, Captain Oates cut a hole in his sleeping bag and kept his frostbitten foot outside because the frostbite thawing was so painful. Was Stanley really as cruel and dry-witted as he is in the show? We have no idea, but he was much younger, and as you can see in this photograph, that he smiled much more in real life. Fitzjames served with him and described him as good-natured and hard-working, though a bit too keen. Jet black hair, very white hands, which are always abominably clean, and shirt sleeves tucked up, giving one unpleasant ideas that he would not mind cutting one's leg off immediately, if not sooner. Well, good sir, his assistant is far less charitable in his writings, saying that he made no effort at work and knows nothing, both with his job and in general. Now for some fun facts about the doctor-surgeon rivalry between good sir and Stanley. Stanley is written as an arrogant doctor lording over the surgeon good sir. Thing is, neither of them were doctors. Their jobs on ship were surgeon Stanley and assistant surgeon good sir. Hilariously, for the characterization of Stanley as a condescending dick, there's probably less reason to call him a doctor than good sir. Stanley was a military surgeon, well experienced in practical and battlefield medicine. While good sir was from a scientific background, he was the conservator of the Surgeons Hall Museum in the Royal College of Surgeons in Edinburgh. He was a member of the Royal Medical Society and even co-authored one of the important early books on cell theory. Neither were doctors, but good sir was a scientist, and one with a very bright future ahead of him. The last bit of evidence that we have on Stanley is two pieces of wood found in Montreal Island. One had Erebus scratched on it, and the other, said Mr. Stanley. It's believed they were pieces of snowshoes. Fitz James admonishes his large crew for slight laxness and cleanliness. This is accurate. Cleanliness, as now, was part of basic discipline. They were stranded, but still in duty. Nine of you are on duty in the log today. That must improve. The next week, that number will be zero. Is that understood? Aye, sir! Fitz James's command style is accurate, too. He's serious, but not harsh. He's not a father figure like Franklin or a distant headmaster like Crozier. More like an older kid taking younger charges on an adventure. The main spine of this episode is Crozier's alcoholism. I've read nothing in the history books about Crozier being a particularly heavy drinker, so this seems to be an invention of Dan Simmons. I think he wanted to juxtapose Crozier with the teetotaler Franklin. Regardless, it is interesting that a dramatization of a man who was probably discriminated against for being Irish has been given a drinking problem. He's run out of bottles in terror and has begun requisitioning Erebus' supplies. His descent to rock bottom continues. Ah, Edward! How fares the raft of the Medusa? Crozier's referencing another of history's naval horrors. The French ship Medusa hit a sandbar in 1816 off the coast of Africa. And I'm going to tell you all about that next time. Hornby, one of the crew, dies on the ice between the ships and his body is taken into Terror's hold. This isn't only because the ship is mostly empty. There's evidence that one or both the ships were really used as a body store, at least for a time. William Brain, the marine who died at Beachy Island, had rat bites all over his body and was more decomposed than the other two, indicating that it was stored for a while, for whatever reason. In a way, good Sir MacDonald, Terror's lead medic, discussed the unrelenting cold. I've heard teeth can explode in near this cold. Imagine. 
I don't have to. In 39, Captain Penny, our lead whaler's tooth, did just that. It seems that this is a bit of a myth, but absolutely Cherry Gerard, one of Captain Scott's men in Antarctica, lost most of his teeth out in the ice, ironically in a journey to and from Cape Crozier, named for the good captain. His were lost due to a mix of scurvy and chattering so violently that they shattered. Good sirs started seeing a bluish line in the gums of one of the men, one of the early signs of lead poisoning. The man suffering from it is a regular crewman, though the chances are the officers would suffer the effects much more quickly than the crewmen. Why? Because the officers had a different diet and ate much more canned food. Canned food sealed with lead solder. A more modern theory suggests that the majority of lead poisoning might have come via the ship's water tanks and central heating. Even if that's the case, the officers would still be affected more because on top of all that, they still ate more canned food. We know that when the crews began the death march, there were 9 dead officers and 15 crewmen, from an initial crew of 24 officers and 105 crewmen. Clearly, what was killing them was hitting the officers unusually hard. I have to say that I love that the crew has put some books under the legs of Crozier's table and are hanging it from the rafters. I don't think I've read about that being done, but I would be shocked if it wasn't a thing. In all his talks with silence, good sir is yet to find anything of use with the tomb back. So Crozier decides to try himself, which kind of reinforces how silly it was to get good sir who spoke no enicted to it to try in the first place. He spent most of the time just learning the language. In a way, she begins to open up with Crozier about the tomb back. As I previously mentioned, it's kind of based on an actual Inuit myth. And here's some details. It's been based on a turn gag, a kind of helpful spirit that a shaman or angakut controls and talks with. The turn gag could be sent to do a particular task, good or bad, or give the shaman access to some power when he needed it. When a turn gag wasn't in use, it was kept by the shaman in the form of a charm that they kept on their body, like the charms that the dead shaman had on him. Essentially, a turn gag was a magical Pokemon. In the novel, the Tumbak is a monster created long before by the Inuit goddess Sedna in order to kill the other gods. After a long war, the other gods won, and the Tumbak was eventually imprisoned around the north of King William Island, eating the body and or soul of anyone who comes close. Well, anyone except the shaman tasked with sort of controlling it, so it doesn't leave its jail. Kanokli dukuhaniak dukut Tumbak. Oh, and in the book, it's just about unkillable. The Tumbak in the book is much more dangerous in general than the one in the TV show. Fitzjames arrives to give Crozier a bollocking for stealing his liquor, and the petulant Crozier on display here is shades in real history. Francis, don't ever call me Francis again. You'll call me what I'm due to be called. I'm talking about the Crozier who didn't message Sir John to tell them that they'd taken a wrong turn on the way to Disco Bay in Greenland, just to see how long it would take them to realise. But still, this is a tiny bit undeserved, I feel, because Crozier's drinking only got completely out of hand when he realised exactly how screwed they were. He spent ages howling into the void until it was too late, and now he's anaesthetised himself. <laughs> Still, he badly needs to snap himself out of it. Blanky tells Crozier to be careful, or what happened to John Ross at Fury Beach will happen to him. As I mentioned a few episodes ago, there was a bit of a screaming match, and everyone got it okay. Worse than happened to John Ross has been happening for a long time. He angrily sends Blanky out to give him an ice report, so he and Fitzjames can have it out just in time for the Tumbak to come aboard and begin killing people. Blanky climbs the rigging to turn himself into bait so the others can attack it. Blanky is easily the toughest person in the show, and the novel. He may well have been the toughest person in the real expedition too. He certainly had a very long and cold career in terrible conditions. Regardless, if Voldemort had chosen Blanky instead of Quirrell, Harry Potter wouldn't survive the first film. I don't know if you've noticed, but Blanky's played by Ian Hart who played Quirrell. I know. I was shocked when I found out too. As the show continues to move away from known history, I have less concrete information that I can talk about. But this is pretty much what happens in the book. The Tumbak tries to kill Blanky, he loses a leg, and it takes a cannonball to the chest. Crozier blames himself for what happened to Blanky and officially hits rock bottom, giving Blanky the rest of his whiskey before his leg is amputated. I think I made a connection tonight, me and it. I feel like we got engaged and I want to celebrate. I have no idea if the actual Crozier and Blanky were friends. Certainly in the show, they go way back, and they served together in real life before terror. But Crozier's letters from the time indicate that he felt he had no friends on board. Side note about amputation in the Victorian era. Surgeons were considered inferior to doctors and mainly did the practical parts of doctoring, such as amputations. And there was a minor thing between them about speed. 
Not only because the faster the amputation, the less suffering the poor person has to go through. It was a macho thing. They also wanted to be faster, better than the others, and in one hilarious case, Surgeon Robert Liston was so fast, he managed to remove not only the man's leg, but his testicles by accident. In another, Liston was so fast that he managed to remove his assistant's fingers and didn't realise until it was way too late. The assistant later died of gangrene. You see, the common belief among surgeons at the time was that cleanliness was squeamishness, and the stiffer a surgeon's coat was with dried blood and pus, the better the surgeon. This scene is way too clean. We end with Crozier bringing the officers together to give Fitzjane's command of the expedition. He's going very cold turkey. And good sir, testing for lead in the food by turning Jack of the Monkey into a canary. 